so first, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present uh, in this seminar series. I want to thank also Olivier Gossner for accepting to be uh, our discussant. And thanks, Olivier Boss, for this very nice introduction. This is joint work with Ina Taneva from the University of Edinburgh. And I would like to motivate this project in the special context of organization. Organizations face all kinds of uncertainty about consumer demands, regulations, production quality, raw materials, technology, financing costs, etc. And protocols are put in place either formally or informally to carry relevant information to the right members of the organization. And when you look more closely, you see that there's a lot of horizontal and vertical protocols within organizations. What we mean by horizontal trans uh, transmission is informing a group of listeners symmetrically and simultaneously. Here are two examples for you. Uh, in fact, coming from a friend who is a, a general director of a company, she was telling us that when there is a sudden, sudden shortage of raw material, in her case, uh, it's platinum, this typically prompts a meeting between her, the general director, supply chain management, and the production team, a meeting during which they apprehend and share uh, relevant information about that sudden shortage of raw material. Another example is when uh, a customer reports non-compliance with quality standards. This typically causes a meeting between her, the general director, and the quality department. Vertical transmission instead refers to information passed down sequentially and perhaps partially from one individual to another. Downstream communication in organization is a prime example of that. And to be even more concrete, information about new regulation, such as the new withholding tax in France, can be transmitted by the head of HR to her team, and then from the HR team to the rest of the company. There are many reasons why such protocols are ubiquitous within organizations in particular, purely logistical reasons. For horizontal transmission, notice that giving information to many people at once, instead of giving the same information to each of them individually, saves on physical communication costs. So to understand this, let's think of academic seminars like this one. We could, in principle, require that a seminar speaker give his or her presentation to each member of the faculty individually and in private. So maybe we don't do this because we enjoy uh, the joint interaction in seminars, but we must also admit that this would be tremendously costly on the speaker. Now, uh, vertical transmission is another uh, economical strategy for the simple reason that delegating information transmission to the receivers themselves can also save on physical communication costs. In this paper, we formally describe all information structures according to their ability to transmit information horizontally or vertically. And within that formalism, we focus on two limit case families of information structures as proof of concept. And we do several things. We first characterize the outcomes that they implement in general finite games. We do some linear programming and we show that uh, these families are in fact globally optimal in binary action environments with complementarities. So a word of clarification, in comparison, direct information structures, which we're all familiar with, they invoke the revelation principle, they make incentive compatible recommendations, they typically do not allow horizontal or vertical transmission. In many problems, optimization over direct information structures leads to action recommendations, which are private information to each agent 
which others are uncertain about. And so that implies that there's hardly any other way but to deliver these action recommendations to each agent in private. So if you think back on the general director, assume that she wants to maximize total effort in the organization, by using a direct information structure, she would have to speak to every single employee uh, in private, individually, which in large organization is just not realistic. So I'm going to skip this very nice quote by Tim Benzant and also just go over the lit review, which I'm happy to come back to if you want to, if you have questions or if you want to understand the, the, where we uh, position ourselves. And I'm going to go directly to the preliminaries. Maybe now is a good time to make sure that the motivation is clear, and then I can uh, go to the formal material. Okay. So I'm going to start with the standard material for now. So there are finitely many players who interact in an environment with an uncertain state an uncertain variable, omega, which lives in a finite space. And the players share a common prior mu about that uh, uncertain state of the world. And their payoffs are possibly uh, state-dependent payoffs. In games of incomplete information, we can describe outcomes using one of these distribution p over a cross omega. So that p is going to tell you what players do in each state and with what probability. So kind of all you need to know uh, in regards to outcome is in that, that uh, little p. There's a special class of outcome distribution called base correlated equilibrium introduced by Berman and Morris in 2014, 15. And we'll see on the next slide uh, the, the relevance in this project, but they are defined by two conditions. First, the marginal of P over state is equal to the prior, which is a physical constraint really. And then there's a second condition, which is an incentive constraint. And it says that each player I is happy to play the recommended action AI rather than deviate to AI prime if other players also obediently follow their recommendations. And here I wanna just highlight the fact that this expect expected value here, these expectations are taking over not only states, but also actions of the other players. And this, this will become relevant quite soon. An information structure is the formalization of a protocol what we mean by a protocol, and it consists of a message space for each agent and a set of conditional distributions which tell you how these um, message profiles are distributed in each state. In this paper, we use the concept, solution concept of pure Bayes Nash equilibrium. But each player is going to receive a message. Given that message, update his or her belief about the state and his or her beliefs about the messages of uh, the other players. And what implementation means is that when you add up the total probability, total equilibrium probability, I should say when you add up the equilibrium probability of omega and A across all state, across all messages, sorry. So that's what you see on the right hand side, so it's to the summation over all messages, you must recover the probability of A omega under P. And then there's this beautiful result by Bergman and Morris, which is a generalization of Almond uh, 1987. P is implementable if and only if P is a base correlated equilibrium. So the set of base correlated equilibria delineates everything that's implementable. So the next slide is going to kick off the new material. Two uh, minor pieces of notation first. Let new i of omega s minus i given s i be i's beliefs about the state and others' messages given i's own message. And it will also be relevant to look at the belief that i, that I would hold 
if not only he knew her, uh, his own message SI, but also the message of player J as J. And we're gonna denote that, abuse notation a little bit and denote it by mu I of omega S minus I, given now these two uh, pieces of information, SI and SJ. We're gonna say that I is weakly more informed than J at S, denoted by this binary relation, if knowing the message of player J would change nothing to player I's belief given SI. So what this means is that there's an at message profile S. There's nothing that player J knows that player I does not know already, including his own message. So this is the strongest way in which you could possibly define uh, what it may mean to be more informed. So some of you might think of a Blackwell version of, of informedness. This is, this is stronger. And then we'll say that I and J are equally informed at S, now denoted with equal sign, if I is weakly more informed than J and J is weakly more informed than I. So I want maybe to pause here to make sure that, just briefly, make sure that this definition is, is correct because we're going to build on this and define horizontal and vertical transmission from this. Okay, so when you know SI, there's nothing that SJ brings to you as player I. So I'll assume that this is clear. And now this is the, the description of all information structures according to their ability to transmit information horizontally or vertically. An information structure allows horizontal transmission to I and J at S if I and J are equally informed at S. So if I and J are equally informed at S, then it means that we could inform them together at once. Uh, they could have obtained their information from separate channels, but if they're equally informed, we, we could inform them together at, at once, so simultaneously. That's, that's the sense of horizontal, that's the meaning of horizontal transmission. And we're going to say that an information structure allows vertical transmission from I to S, from I to J at S. If I is weakly more informed than J at S, and I satisfies communication incentives. So for there to be vertical transmission from I to J, I has to be able to deliver whatever information J needs at S. That's the first requirement, but I has also, also has to be willing to uh, deliver information to J. That's the sense of, of vertical transmission. So now, first thing that we do in the paper is to characterize the set of implementable outcomes coming from horizontal or vertical transmission. I want to return to the motivation behind horizontal transmission. There are costs associated with the transmission of private messages due to the necessity of creating and using separate communication channels. So from my perspective in this seminar, there's just one communication channel, even though I'm speaking to about 50 people. So if I was talking to each one of you individually and in private, there would be 46 communication channel, which would be more costly for me because we would have to create and use, I would have to create and use these separate communication channels. However, this seminar is horizontal transmission, there's one communication channel. So the, the intuition behind why horizontal transmission uh, is interesting in terms of cost is because it minimizes the number of communication channels. Okay. We're going to capture horizontal transmission through the concept of a meeting, which is an abstraction of two conditions. The content of a meeting is common knowledge among the participants, at least in principle. And when you are in a meeting, not only is the content commonly known among the participants, but you also know who is in the meeting and who is not in the meeting. Right? So the identity of the participants is common knowledge as well. 
So for us, this is going to lead to this first limit case of, um, of horizontal transmission. And this is what I will mean for now by horizontal transmission. At, at the end of the talk, I will generalize this notion of meetings. For now, it's a single meeting. An information structure SP is a single meeting scheme. If there exists a collection of subsets of agents, and you should think of these M of S as the only meeting which is organized at message profile S. Right? So if there exists a collection of subsets of agents, and at most one message for each agent, such that the two conditions I mentioned on the previous slide are satisfied. That is, someone in a meeting, anyone in a meeting, is weakly more informed than anybody else. Right? So in particular, she's weakly more informed than everybody else at the meeting because they are equally informed. And if there is a single meeting which is ever organized, given that she knows who else is in the meeting, she knows who was not in the meeting. And when you're not in the meeting, you get that message SI tilde, which you, th you should think of as the empty message. So the idea of a single meeting is that either you're in the meeting receiving information or you're out of the meeting getting an empty message. Right? So if you're in the meeting, you know who else is receiving the same message as you. You know who else is there with you at the meeting. So those who are not at the meeting must get an empty message as I told them. So I'm going to explain that on the next slide a little bit more. And maybe nice, it will be a good time also to uh, clarify if you guys have questions. So this is a generalization of public information because it is information communicating publicly, but to a restricted audience. So who participates in the meeting, that may vary depending on S. Non-participation to a meeting may also carry different information for different players. So here we're not saying that new I, given the empty message for I, so given SI uh, tilde, we're not saying that this must be equal to new J given SJ tilde. So those two could be different. Right? So it could be that in my case, say the, the only time I'm not invited to a meeting, it could be because the two Olivia are meeting. So even though it's the empty message, it can still be informative. So from an Xente perspective, there are many possible meetings, but only one will be realized. And the concept of meeting doesn't mean that it has to be a physical uh, gathering. You could, you could think of this as emails. You would rather send an email to a list of recipients rather than send that same email to each recipient in private or to play with the, um, the recipient fields, BCC and CC, very, very creatively, right? So now is a good time maybe to uh, stop and answer questions if you guys have any on this. So I don't know if I should look at the chat or if I should, uh, no? Maybe people can raise their hands if they have questions. So maybe I jump in here. Um, I would have a question about these at most one type as I who is not invited. Right. So, so how so much of a restriction is that? Uh, it's not extremely intuitive. So, just right. So that's. I mean, that's quite restrictive. So here we're assuming that there's a single meeting. So either you're in, in which case you're receiving information or you're out, but there's only one way to be out. And it's when you're out, you're receiving no information. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. When you're out, you're receiving the empty message. In, in, in the paper, we relax this assumption later on, and then we say that when you're there are multiple meetings that could be happening, and you're part of one of those meetings. And so you, you would have several messages when you're not in a meeting, it could be that you are in another meeting, so you're receiving another message, or it could be that you're invited to no meeting at all, in which case you're receiving the empty message. So here, there's just one way Either you're in the meeting or you're out. There's not a, another meeting which is organized that you're part of. Right, so we're starting with this um, more restricted form. We're going to characterize what happens, and then at the end we can generalize. Mm -hmm. 
Any other Hi. questions? Yeah. So, um, so I, the, the setup that you have made sense to me from a in-person meeting uh, perspective. And then you brought up the idea of email. And I, it wasn't clear to me how your model would map the distinction between a blind CC mass email and a CC mass email, um, right. where the only thing you're, you're manipulating is knowledge of meeting attendance. Right. So here, it's basically a, a mass email, but where you decide who is in the recipient list. So when you're in a mass email, not in a BCC, you know who else has received that email. If you're in a BCC, if you're part of the black carbon copy, then uh, you, know, you don't know who else has received the email. So that's the difference. Uh, being in an email sent to a list, that's common knowledge among the list. So this is what this is here. We're saying that all you will ever have to do will be to send one email to a list of people. You will not send multiple emails and you will not have to decide who should be in the BCC, who should be in CC and so on. So that's the sense in which it's easier. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. okay. So, all right. So the first question we're asking is what strategic outcomes can emerge in a game where incomplete information is described by single meeting schemes? And this is our first main result. A base correlated equilibrium distribution P can be implemented by a single meeting scheme if and only if for all players I, there exists one action AI tilde such that all other actions must satisfy the inequality that you see on your screen. Um, I want to return to the BC, uh, the, the BC conditions before and, and, and kind of go back and forth to, to make sure that um, this is clear. So returning to the base correlated equilibrium condition, that's the standard Bayesian incentive constraint where you're taking your expectation over states of the world and over other people's action. Now, when you compare that to what you see on your screen here, you see that we've dropped the summation over A minus I. So with this condition, this condition is stronger than the BC condition because we're unpacking the BC condition and we say it has to hold, not on average across A minus I, but it has to hold for each A minus I. And then you have that AI tilde action that not spoken about until now, that AI tilde is subjected to the standard BC condition where you, where you take the expectation over states and over uh, action profiles. So this result, um, oops. So this result is proved, I mean, one way, sufficiency is proved by identifying a, a set of canonical information structures, which are not direct information structures, but they are augmented direct information structures. I mean, they're not direct, sorry, they're augmented, they're an augmentation of a direct information structures where the messages that people receive are an action as well as the action profiles of their, of their opponents. And this is the sense in which they're participating in a meeting. When you're in a meeting, you know the message profiles, you know the messages of the other players in the meeting, and because of the assumption of pure strategy, you know the action that they're going to play. So let's see what this characterization gives us in a simple example, battle of the sexes, complete information game. So you, should, you can think of this as having one state of the world, and because we have four action profiles, right? Uh, outcome distributions are objects in R4, but because they must add up to one, then we're fine in a three-dimensional uh, in a three-dimensional world, which allows us to represent this graphically. On the left-hand side, what you see are correlated equilibria, and on the right-hand side, you see the single meeting schemes uh, outcomes. There are at least two striking features of the single meeting scheme outcomes. First, uh, and, and this is a feature not just of this game, but also of all base games, B-A-S-E, base games, which are coordination games. 
single meeting scheme outcomes are a union of phases of base correlated equilibria. So here, the, the, the single meeting schemes are the BC on the back wall or on the floor. And the second property is that the pure strategy public information outcomes lie at the intersection of all phases. So it makes sense that so given that single meeting schemes are a generalization of public information, it makes sense that, that public information lives in it. What's uh, more interesting is that it lives at the intersection of all these spaces. And that's what you see. I don't know if you see me hovering um, over it here, but that's the, the connection between the two vertices here, right? The, the, the intersection of the bases of these two triangles. So in the interest of time, now I'm gonna move on to vertical transmission and, and do the same thing. Consider the following motivation. A sender who has to bear the cost of transmission, either directly by doing it herself or indirectly by delegating and compensating the agents may find delegation by vertical transmission cost effective. If, for example, costs are convex in the size of the items. So in this paper, we're not, modeling cost explicitly. We're just providing this as an intuition for why these objects are appealing. And consider C of N strictly larger than N, uh, of N times C of one. That means that the cost of speaking directly to N people is strictly larger, strictly larger than N times the cost of speaking to one person. So if cost were convex in that sense, then, decentralization would, would make sense. I think Jer uh, Jeremiah, you've raised your hand. You would like to ask a question? Sorry, I forgot to put it down. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, so as I was saying, if costs are convex in this sense, then the uh, decentralization uh, is, is cost effective. We capture vertical transmission through the concept of a hierarchy, which has two ingredients, to be able to vertically transfer information to one another, players must be ordered with respect to how informed they are, and to be willing to transfer information to one another, incentive constraint must be satisfied. So taking things one at a time, first to be able, so an information structure SP is an information hierarchy. If players are totally ordered, with respect to how informed they are. Right? So not only they are totally ordered, but also with respect to the strongest notion of uh, more informed. So there's literally like a ranking, a total ranking of players, and they're able, because of our informedness notion, to deliver information to one another in a sequence. The fact that they're able doesn't mean that they're willing. So that's the next page. A distribution P can be implemented by a delegated hierarchy. If there exists an information hierarchy, so that's to be able, right? If there exists an information hierarchy and an equilibrium A star, such that this first condition is satisfied, we've seen that before, that's the implementing implementation requirement. What matters is condition two, right? So if for all I, messages of player I, it's little s i, and messages of people which are below I in the hierarchy, the following inequality is satisfied. So player I finds it optimal to play his equilibrium action AI star of SI. So he prefers to do that rather than deviate to AI prime in, in uh, orange. And he also prefers to deliver truthfully the message to people below him in the hierarchy, right? S, uh, F, S, excuse me, of people which are less than I. So he prefers to do that rather than lie to them and report S prime. That's, but what, why is that appealing? An information, a delegated hierarchy is appealing because you only need to speak directly to the most informed player, I star, and from there, the desired information is going to trickle down the entire hierarchy. So you plant the seed at I star, and from there ensues a sequential cheap talk game 
in which each player is in turn a receiver of information and then a sender of information to his, to his uh, immediate follower. Right? And of course, players also choose action strategically. The condition I presented on previous slide means that there's no profitable deviation from uh, truthful information transmission and from equilibrium play. Same question as before, what strategic outcomes can emerge in a game where incomplete information is described by delegated hierarchies, that's our second main result. A distribution P can be implemented by a delegated hierarchy if and only if it distributes the state in the same way as the prior, it's the physical constraint. And if there exists a total order of players along which for all actions of player I, actions of people below I in the hierarchy, the following inequality three is satisfied. This inequality says that player I um, finds it optimal to play AI rather than switch to AI prime and also finds it optimal to report truthfully the action recommended for people below him in our hierarchy rather than recommending for them the A prime version. So if I, wanna, if I wanna compare this to the BC condition, remember that there's double sum here. It's the sum over all omega and over all A minus I. Here, if you're a player I, you're uncertain about what people above you in the hierarchy are doing. So you're taking the average about what these guys are doing and also the average across state. But you know what people below you are doing and you must be willing to recommend that truthful. In Battle of the Sexes, you get a very small set of uh, implementable outcomes that are, I mean, outcomes that are implementable by delegated hierarchy, only the pure Nash equilibria. In general, delegated hierarchies and SMS, these two sets are not related by inclusion, but they are in battle of the sexes. Just to remind you, these two faces of BCE, those were the set of outcomes that were implementable by a uh, single meeting scheme. Here, we're just gonna get the two vertices, these two that are with the, the, the black dots here. The intuition is you, you can't randomize over these two dots because if you're the guy at the top of the hierarchy, one of these two equilibria, you strictly prefer. So you would never be willing to randomize. There's just one of the two that gives you a strictly higher payoff and that's the one you stick to, right? You, you would never want, you would lie. I, if, if, if you were supposed to recommend the other one, you would lie and say, no, that's the, that's the Nash that I prefer. So what can we do with these characterization? The first thing we do is some linear programming. And so I'm just gonna go very quickly over this. So the characterizations are conducive to linear programming because the two theorems I gave you, each characterize outcomes as a union of classes each class being represented by a set of linear inequalities, right? So these theorems tell you that optimization over single meeting schemes or over delegated hierarchy is a maximum of linear programs. So I'm gonna skip over that where we explain this. And, and in fact, I'm also gonna skip over the, the, some interesting lessons that we get from linear programs. So we use these linear programs in uh, the linear network model of Bayeste, Calvar, Mengo, and Zenu for three players, three actions. And, and despite uh, how specific the example is, we, we do get some interesting insights which differ from what we know from binary action, super modular information design. So the more familiar you are with that, the more surprised uh, you may be by these little vignettes here. So I'm gonna skip uh, this in the interest of time and tell you what else we do with these characterization. So, so the linear programming is in some sense, oftentimes a constrained information design uh, problem. Now let's move on to uh, another application of the characterization, the optimality result. We identify environments in which an optimal base correlated equilibrium must satisfy our characterization, which means that horizontal or vertical transmission is gonna be globally optimal. Where by horizontal or vertical, I mean SMS or delegated hierarchy, okay? These environments are binary action environments 
in which players have an outside option. So they can opt out and secure zero by playing action zero. And there'll be more assumptions on the complementarities. If you'd like, you can think of linear networks or global games of regime change. I, hopefully I will have a little bit of time to talk about regime change, so I'm not gonna uh, go over it here. In which problems are single meeting schemes optimal? I'm gonna give you the answer in one slide and just this one. Um, so let VM be the space of increasing. So V is gonna be our objective function. And by increasing, I mean that when an action profile A prime is larger than A, which means that every player I plays weakly larger action in A prime than in A, V of A prime given uh, at omega is larger than V of A omega for all omega. So for instance, an objective would be the sum of the AI. That would mean maximizing total effort, total adoption. And we're gonna prove our third main result under a weak complementarity assumption, which you see here. For each player, each player finds it um, better, prefers when she, so when she plays one, she likes when more people uh, play one as well. So that's, that's a basic strategic complementarity condition, right? The player plays one, her utility is increasing in A minus I, so other people playing one as well. Theorem three, if players play a game with weak complementarities and binary actions, and if V is in the cone of VM union UI, union the UIs, the utilities, I'll come back to this, then there is an optimal base correlated equilibrium which can be implemented by a single meeting scheme. So first thing, there's a lot of objectives in the cone. Not only, so the, what, what is the cone? It's these two sets plus their positive linear combination. So you get not only all the increasing objectives like uh, total, total adoption, total efforts, right? Or any increasing functions of, of efforts, adoption and so on. Not only do you get the UI, so weighted welfare, but you get combinations of both. So you could be a general director who's interested in a measure of performance and also a measure of welfare. Or you could be a general director who's interested in uh, the welfare of part of the organization and effort of uh, another subset of the organization. This theorem is proven by using theorem one and noticing that if you have an optimal BC which violates the necessary and sufficient condition of theorem one, then it means by using these AI tilde, I didn't really explain what they were, but if you set AI tilde to one and you look at the inequality I displayed there, a violation of that inequality means that someone would like to switch from zero to one, which is only good for welfare or for monotone objectives. So if you have a P star that violates the condition, there's another P star which will satisfy that condition and will have more ones, essentially. That's, that's yeah, very uh, strong, uh, severe summary of, of height, height works. Now moving on to, I'm gonna skip all this and say, uh, ask some questions in which problems are delegated hierarchies optimal and give you the answer also in one slide. That's our fourth main result. Let VSM now, it, it, so it's so this VSM does not inc only include increasing objectives, but we're adding the requirement of supermodularity now. Supermodularity means that there's a desire for coordination. So not only do you want uh, players to play large action profiles, but you like when that happens in a coordinated fashion. In other words, you would prefer a coin toss over two players playing one or playing zero rather than a coin toss over one of them only playing one, okay? So an assumption four is also stronger than uh, assumption three. We used to say that UI of one is increasing in A minus I. Now we're saying that UI is super modular on A omega, which, which adds the requirement that player I not only does he like when his opponents play more ones, but he likes when they are coordinated in their efforts. And player one, I'm sorry, player I 
when, when he or she plays one, she also likes uh, when the state is larger. Here in four, if players play a binary action game, which we're gonna call super modular game, meaning satisfies assumption four, and if V is in the cone, then there exists an optimal BCE, which can be implemented by a delegated hierarchy. So I will not tell you much about the proof here. Um, okay. So what I would like to do next, I, I think I have four minutes left. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, actually you can you can speak like from five to ten without any problem because you've got questions as well. So. Okay, all right, excellent. So I want to spend some time on uh, the application to regime change, which is a nice way of illustrating the diversity of uh, optimal hierarchy. So saying that a delegated hierarchy is optimal is one thing. It's also quite interesting to see the workings of that like in, in the details, who should be at the top of, of the hierarchy, who should be at the bottom, depending on the objective you're trying to maximize. So it's a standard regime change game with N workers. So it's an organization with N workers. They have to choose to produce effort or no effort towards a project of quality omega. When player I chooses to produce effort, she contributes kappa I to the success of the project. Um, um, exerting effort costs CI. And if enough agents produce efforts, meaning the sum of their contributions, kappas, if that's larger than one minus omega, then there's a, re a regime change from the status quo to the project being successful. And those who have participated, they get their benefit BI minus CI, which is strictly positive. Otherwise, if you don't participate, then you secure a payoff of zero, right? So standard regime change game here, it's an organization. You can think of this as currency prices, bank loans. So let's say first that you wanna maximize the total probability of effort. And just notice that worker I exerts effort if and only if the expected benefit is larger than the cost. And so when you exert effort, you only get the benefits stochastically, but for sure you get, um, for sure you, pay, you have to pay the cost. So the larger the cost benefit ratio is, the more difficult it is to incentivize that agent to, uh, to produce effort. And so the more optimistic you have to keep eye in order to keep him or her uh, investing. The optimal hierarchy in this case is going to be to rank agents according to their cost benefit ratio. And this is how it works. Imagine, take the guy that has the largest cost benefit ratio. When this person invests along this hierarchy, she knows that because she has the largest cost benefit ratio, when she invests, everybody else is also asked to invest. And so, that keeps her quite optimistic about the success of the project. When she receives from the designer the recommendation to invest, she's happy to tell her successor and the hierarchy to invest, and that guy is happy to tell the next person and so on. When she's told not to invest, she has utility zero no matter what, so she's happy weekly to transfer whatever information. So in this case, the optimal hierarchy is completely characterized by cost benefit ratio. Now let's pick another objective, which is in the cone, and let's pick weighted welfare. In this case, to maximize people's happiness, kind of trivially, you want to give them total information. And it turns out that any order also is gonna guarantee that information is transmitted truthfully from one player to another. So you're gonna state you're gonna uh, uh, reveal the state truthfully at the top and truth is gonna trickle down. How is this gonna work? You give, you tell the, the player at the top that it's worth it for him or her to invest. If that's the case, she's happy to tell the next player that it's worth it for him or her to invest as well. If I invest, I'm happy that you invest with me. So then everybody is gonna transfer that information. If you have a zero at the top, so no, it's not worth it to invest. The project cannot possibly succeed. 
then I'm happy to transfer that information to the person below me without lying because I've no, you know, I'm indifferent. So in this case, truth telling seated at the top, whatever order is going to implement the, the, the truth telling um, information that you want. Objective, yet another objective to see the diversity in ranking. Now, I assume that you want to maximize the sum of player one and two's utilities, but you want to maximize effort from the rest of the organization. So it means that you're benevolent towards workers one and two, but you want to squeeze as much effort as you can from everybody else. What is the optimal delegated hierarchy in this case? You're going to put one and two at the top, and the rest of the population is going to be ranked according to their cost-benefit ratio. So if you're player one and you're told the truth, right? So if you're at the top, you're told the truth here. So I'm telling you to invest. Then when you invest, you know that everybody below you is going to invest. And so people at the top whose welfare you care about, they're going to invest less than those people uh, from whom you're trying to squeeze as much effort as possible. So when you tell somebody at the top invest, he's happy to tell everybody else to invest. Player two, two tells player three and so on. When you tell these two guys at the top, hold on, it's not worth it uh, for you to invest. But I, I still want to squeeze as much effort from people from uh, uh, worker three onward. Player one and two, they opt out, they get zero and they are weakly indif right? They're indifferent to furthering the designer's objective and um, transferring these one recommendations to people below them. Okay, so this is a nice way of seeing the variety of uh, optimal uh, hierarchies here. I want to give you another example and then uh, conclude. This example serves a different purpose. Here we want to show that optimization may require one to inform players equally so you may want to give full information to, 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 to or equal information to the, those people, but it doesn't mean that this can be achieved in any possible order. So it could be that even though you treat them equally, there's a very specific way in which that equal information can uh, be achieved in the population. So here is, here's the examples. We have three players, two actions each, two states of the world, minus one half, one half, and you have that payoff structure where player one will play action one only uh, and would like to, is happy to play action one only in the high state. Player two is happy to play action one only if the state is high and player three also plays action one. And player three is happy to play one only if the state is high and player one plays action one. Let's say that you want to maximize this measure of welfare. It turns out that full information is optimal in this example, but there's only one way in which truth can be spread uh, truthfully in this population. And the only order that does that is one, three, two. So it means that even in this case, where you would like to treat people completely symmetrically, delegation has bite. Right? There's, there's not, the fact that they're treated equally doesn't mean that they're going to be treated equally from a delegation perspective. One has to be at the top, three has to be in the middle, uh, and two has to be at the bottom. And you can see that if you were to put, um, let's say, player three at the top, he would be happy to lie to player one if that allowed, if that led player one to play one as well. Uh, so I'm happy to say that this, even if the state is minus one half. I'm happy to say to player one that he should play one and then I play one as well, right? This sum here would be positive, minus one and a half plus one. So anyways, I'm going to conclude now, maybe very briefly say that I, uh, we generalize these concepts to many meetings and also random hierarchies. So many, many meetings means that instead of having one meeting happening and if you're not at the meeting, then uh, you receive that empty message. Maybe many meetings are happening simultaneously, which gives you a greater variety of incentives. And in the limit, if you allow for little n meetings, 
then it means that you're back to, to private information if you wish. Okay? So all kinds of questions one could ask, what's the smallest number of meeting that I need to implement something? Um, what's an optimal M meeting scheme and so on. Also, as I said, in organization, you don't have to have a fixed hierarchy structure. It's not unreasonable to assume that a director, like owner of a company, would be willing, would be able to choose the order of managers and supervisors as a function of message he wants to transmit. It's not necessary that you have just one uh, hierarchy. Right? So the hierarchy could depend on the message. And so we characterize uh, the outcomes for, for both. I conclude now. What have we tried to do? So we have modeled the organizational structure of information with respect to transmission. And we have tied these organizational constraint on information to constraints on strategic outcomes, which are relatively in intuitive. And from there, we are still able to enjoy the linear programming, which we like so much, so much from base correlated equilibrium. So we do some of that and we show some intuitions coming from linear programming and the linear model. And we also show that in binary action environments with complementarities, the optimal BCEs must satisfy the uh, sufficient condition, sufficient necessary and sufficient condition for uh, uh, SMS and delegated hierarchy implementation. And at the end, we generalize that to many meetings and random delegated hierarchies. And that's my time. Maybe I can turn off the lights a bit dark in my office, just one second. Thanks a lot, Laurent, for the talk. Yes, I think it's a very, very uh, interesting topic and also very interesting uh, contribution. Uh, I want just to give a few, um, I don't know, highlights on, on uh, different angles of the uh, literature and approaches to the uh, question of communication. Uh, well, partly in organizations, but not only in organizations. So this is clearly an important topic, uh, communication in organizations, uh, according to Roy Radner, 92 and 93. He wrote, uh, more than one half of US workers, including managers, do information processing as their primary activity. So that's you know, something huge, very significant. And, and there is a whole literature that, uh, that followed, including work by uh, Van Zandt and, um, and Laurent presented uh, some papers in this literature. There is even a field, uh, it's more a field of management, I believe, than a field of economics called uh, organizational communication. So people consider it's an important question and uh, I think it's good that uh, economists can contribute to this. Now, um, what, what, you know, what, what should uh, maybe um, uh, uh, an economic model uh, do or try to achieve in this? Um, in my view, there is, uh, there is a balance to have uh, between here what I put generality and tractability and the other is uh, relevance and simplicity. So it's, um, it could be a little bit surprising in a sense that uh, generality comes with tractability. Uh, but in fact, this is the case. If you look at uh, you know, general concepts, uh, correlated equilibrium, base correlated equilibrium, yeah, that's the page. Based correlated equilibrium, uh, they have very simple characterizations. Uh, Laurent explained that uh, you know, they are written as linear programs. So this is very nice. You have a finite number of constraints. They are very easy to write down and they have a, a simple mathematical uh, form. And it's easy even to optimize on them. Okay? Once you have a, a, a simplex, a convex polyhedron, you can choose the point with certain normative properties uh, you can look for, you know, efficiency, you can look for fairness, uh, anything that you like. And then there is relevance and simplicity. And when I say simplicity, I mean really the simplicity of communication. Uh, relevance, I mean uh, relevance of the economic examples, uh, you know, in the sense of uh, 
maybe we don't care of all games, we care about certain games. And simplicity is maybe in the form of the form that the communication takes uh, place. Uh, we'll come back to this point. Uh, there is, you know, of course, an important literature in mechani mechanism design on communication, but there it's a little bit of a black box approach, or there is also, I think that uh, Laurent had previously a quote of uh, Van Zandt, you know, a certain approach with decentralized communication with lots of messages. So this is maybe not I call what I would call simplicity. Uh, maybe by simplicity, I mean simplicity of the communication protocol. So maybe we can move to the to the next slide. Okay. So uh, in my view, when I think of communication, at least uh, one element that uh, I have very, very much in mind is uh, the work on communication equilibria uh, by Forge and Meyerson. Um, well, the approach is a little bit of a black box approach, uh, just like in mechanism design. So uh, players receive some information in the first place. There is a form of information structure. They all send a report to a mediator. The mediator does its funny computation. Uh, the mediator can do anything arbitrary, but at the end sends back a recommendation or a message to each of the players and the players choose their actions in the game. And the revelation principle shows that you can all, it's, it's sufficient to study mechanisms in which uh, players reveal truthfully uh, their types or the information they have in the first place. And the uh, mechanism makes what's called direct recommendations. So instead of sending any message, it just recommends them to play a certain action and uh, players follow this action. Um, I like to quote, I mean, to refer to the work of Arman in this as well, because uh, I think Laurent also insisted on this point that if you look at um, correlated equilibria, you have a similar uh, result that you can look at correlated equilibria as a set of equilibrium distributions induced by players receiving any correlated information. But for that, it's, it's sufficient to look at uh, mechanisms or, or distributions in which players receive uh, directly recommendations of actions, which is what allows to have this simple um, uh, linear programming type of formula. But of course, this is very beautiful. This is very nice. Uh, but a bit too, you know, black box. Uh, you know, there is this big centralizer uh, who makes these recommendations, funny things. Uh, we like to think of, uh, of, uh, of uh, communication as something being decentralized. And actually, it's a big question nowadays, right? I mean, a lot of protocols are more and more centralized uh, through uh, the web, through uh, uh, recommendation systems, through, you know, even if you think of matching, it's becoming very centralized and so on. But we still like to think of communication as decentralized. And the question becomes, when can we decentralize the equilibria of uh, Forge Meyerson? And there is a big literature there that uh, I think it finds its roots in computer science. And there are very interesting papers on mental poker. So uh, if we don't have a deck of cards, how can we play poker together by exchanging messages? And uh, cryptography is very involved in there. Uh, public cryptography, how can you send me messages so that uh, I'm the only one to understand what you send me and the others don't understand? Uh, even though all our communication is public, uh, there is a lot of important work there. Uh, and, and, and what is shown is that in a decentralized way, you can generate basically any information structure that you want. So uh, if you think of poker, this is really, you generalize, uh, you generate some correlated information. Um, more to game theory economics, uh, the work of Francois Forge, Barani shows similar results. That through decentralized processes with direct messages, you can implement any uh, communication, any any communication pro protocol, basically. And there there is more work to that. Um, so one thing that's that's uh, that's key here is um, when you look at uh, a mechanism, you have, uh, of course, what matters are the information, the uh, incentive compatibility uh, conditions, and these depend on your game, right? But in a sense, the way you can decentralize information is not by caring about your game. It's caring only about the fact that once players 
have their information in the original protocol, they don't want to deviate. So uh, this kind of simplifies a little bit. And what I think is interesting there is that it makes communication like a game on its own. You communicate to communicate. The object is communication. The object is not the actions that you are going to choose later on in the game. You can abstract from that when you study communication. So really communication is an item of study uh, by itself. Uh, Laurent also insisted on, 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 on the presence of costs. That's, uh, that's a motivation for certain types of protocols. Um, maybe, you know, partial to, to, to what I did myself and, and to what I'm more familiar with. Uh, there is also this very important large uh, engineering, engineering uh, uh, literature, starting with the work of Shannon. And um, I have to say, you know, somehow we, we are close to this flavor of uh, engineering, even though what we obtain here is, is very different. What Laurent presented is very different. There is this idea of engineering something which is, uh, uh, you know, something which is efficient. So um, in, in the work presented by Laurent, uh, um, uh, cost is a motivation for simple ways of communication, like direct communication. Of course, here we are back to the work of Crawford and Sobel, but the difficulty there, you know, is that we are very much in a relevant example where we have an informed sender, an uninformed receiver, and there is a question of um, the difference in incentives between the two, uh, and that affects the equilibrium efficiency, so it's really an economic question of importance. The problem is we lose economic interpretation, we lose the geometry, so it's really very nice, it's very important, but somehow it becomes you know, hard maybe to look at uh, generalizations uh, through uh, the geometry claims. So maybe we can move to the, to the next uh, slide uh, where, so I would say, you know, we have two, two characterizations uh, in, 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 in two, two frameworks. I mean, those were the main results presented. Uh, with meetings, information is pooled. So uh, basically, uh, every time uh, um, uh, Laurent and Ina show that uh, in, in both the context, let's say, of meetings and ERTs, uh, equilibria uh, can be characterized as subsets of BC. You don't have all the base correlated equilibria. You have only some that match a form of communication. And through meetings, uh, you see that the information constraints as are that each agent optimizes given public information, uh, except perhaps the one who was not informed of the meeting. So that's, that's a little bit of a question. And the, uh, in hierarchies, uh, when looking at uh, uh, incentive constraints, um, uh, everyone takes choices of superiors are given and then makes a certain average on the actions of subordinates, which are, which are not known. Okay. And what's very nice is that those are very simple characterizations. So um, I think the, the, the paper strikes a very nice balance between the two. Now I would like to move to the next slide and perhaps come back to the, to the basis of, of Forge and Marierson. And I would like, and, and, and uh, Laurent will, will answer, I hope. I mean, I want to give a, you know, uh, a, a chance to, to, to discuss this. Uh, if you look at the, the original work of uh, Marierson and, and Forge, so the way things happen is that players receive information. So this is called their types, okay? So uh, you have a distribution on states of nature and, and, and signals to the player and, uh, and everyone is informed of their types. Okay, then they exchange information. Then they can play according to all the information they have, which is their original type and their information. So there clearly there are two parts of the incentive constraint. One, which is in the communication protocol, you want people to be truthful. I mean, if you write the, the closed form or you want them to follow a certain Nash equilibrium in the communication part, and then you want them to play something once they have received the information. In the paper, if I understand properly, because I want to be, uh, you know, to, 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 be, to be on the cautious side here, uh, players receive information. Then, uh, well, I don't know if they receive information, actually. That's, that's, well, they do receive information, okay? But I think we are not in a model where they receive information, then they communicate strategically. It's a little bit different. I think that players receive information, but the properties of the information structure itself embeds the hierarchical structure of communication. 
okay and that's that's something you know that's something different so you're asking is it better to be in a system where one is more informed than two and more informed than three or in a in a system in which one and two and three are informed so equally so i would say we are slightly on the information design perhaps side uh, if my understanding is correct, because even though Laurent spoke about incentive constraints in the one of the in communication about lying in uh, one of the of, of the last examples, I didn't have the impression that these were central to the to the to the to the characterization. Uh, but rather, the incentive constraints on following the actions are central to communication. So it may very well be the possibility that the work kind of you know cuts off a little bit one part of the uh, of the difficulties through uh, through this um, through this constraint uh, it's a matter of interpretation of what information represents uh, in particular if you know information is verifiable then we may think of uh, what uh, what is presented of the solution concept as an outcome of something um, but Maybe I would like to see uh, some more kind of micro foundation in a model in which players strategically communicate at equilibrium. Okay, uh, so that's I think my main maybe clarification point about the uh, about the paper, and also potentially where it is interesting as well. Right? It's not it's not it's not a criticism. It's it's also maybe trying to highlight a place where the paper is original. And uh, gives room for uh, for extensions and for uh, for breakthrough. Um, I have just a few other comments or questions that I can uh, ask quickly. So one was uh, on the next slide on uh, what happens if all types uh, are called up to a meeting. Why 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 are all types except one called up to a meeting? And I didn't really really understand yet if that's a you know a technical question or um or an interpretation question like all the types that are not called up could be pooled uh, or something like this because you can pool incentive constraints uh in certain cases just the way oman did for instance um in hierarchies yes yeah, so i I'm, I'm very curious about bottom-up information transmission okay so that comes back a little bit to the questions i previously had uh, about who sends information to whom and how do they receive information. So if you think of a firm and subsidiaries, uh, the main firm may have as an objective to coordinate production between subsidiaries. I, I think uh, Butcher Design or others uh, work on these, uh, these type of models. Uh, and then of course, the, the information flow bottom up is uh, very important as well as the information uh, flow top down. Uh, then on the generalizations, Laurent presented quite a bit. So um, what, what, what I'd like to see, maybe or understand a little bit, is since the characterization with one meeting is so simple and so elegant, uh, it can be nicely used as a building block to create more things. So maybe even beyond uh, 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 the question of nested communication, several, uh, several uh, meetings in a row, uh, we can be interested in, um, I don't know, uh, directions of research on, on a whole organizational structure and optimization of this organizational structure based on the uh, simple blocks. That's all I had. Maybe I was a bit long. I'm sorry, I'm always long. Should I, should I spend a few minutes uh, answering Olivier, you know, maybe with, or... Uh... Yeah, we have all the time that we want. If people want to leave, they can leave the room without any problem. So take your time to reply, it's uh, no problem. So first I would like to thank Olivier for his great discussion of the paper and the nice directions that, that he suggested is giving us a lot of food um, for thought here. And I, let me start with this slide. <clears throat> the previous one, I, I will need more a bit more to end. So back to six, I think this one, I will need uh, some clarification. I, Ina was nodding, so maybe she can uh, <laughs> be in charge of that. So uh, why, so back to six, I'm sorry, that's what I meant. 
why are all the types of a player called up except at most one? So there, so this is the sense in which this, these information structures are limit case. There's no really a reason, it's just a nice way to, to start and give a simple characterization. We are well underway to find a characterization where more than uh, one type are called up. I think this is what you mean here. I think you mean that all types of a player are part of a meeting except one, mm -hmm. right? So in the characterization mm -hmm. of multiple meeting schemes, there would be, depending on how many meetings you want to organize, there would be more. So I, why, I guess, just for simplicity as a way of illustrating uh, an extreme- I, To rephrase the question, what becomes difficult or what is the, you know, uh, 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 why don't doesn't the, the 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 concept assume that a certain subset gets called up to a meeting? A certain subset of types gets called. The others don't get called. And instead of saying you have this constraint for one type, you have the constraint for several types. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm probably not clear. I'm I'm, I'm not sure. So so Ina, you can jump in if that makes. Uh, I I'm I'm a little bit. So I think uh, if I understand correctly, Olivier is asking, couldn't we have an information structure where multiple signals are being non-invited to a meeting, right? Yes, Someone? that's right. Yes, right. Also, maybe that's, yeah, I interpret the signals as types. Uh, maybe yeah. it's about the interpretation. Right, yeah. right. So, so right. basically, basically, you can then pull all of those because they are not. So, so the thing is that if you have a single meeting scheme for each message profile, a subset mm -hmm. of the agents receive the same message because they're invited to a meeting mm -hmm. and the ones that are not invited receive that S tilde message. Now you could okay. aggregate all of the S tildes into one, right? Okay. Um, if there are multiple of that. So in a sense, okay. um, I guess we directly, we, we basically wanted to capture either you're invited to a meeting and you know exactly. which meeting okay. you're invited I get it. to. I get it. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, does that clarify? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. So again, it's a question of interpretation, you see, because of the... Yeah, it's not a type, it's just a exactly. signal and you don't it's need more than one. And then they pull their types or something like this. Right. It's just you have no information, you were not invited. Thank you. Right. So thanks, Ina, for jumping in here. I guess... I guess there's only one way to not be invited, right? So, uh, you, as, as Ina just said, you could pull these multiple messages in which you're not invited, and, mm -hmm. right? So, I, so then, uh, second question, how about bottom-up information transmission? I completely agree with you. I think the order in which transmission happens, especially when we move on to random uh, hierarchy is not fixed. So who's at the bottom, who's at the top, depends on the message to be to be transmitted. And so I think that having one, two, three, or mm -hmm, three, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. that would be then available. And so, you know, in the examples I was giving, maybe the general director is the one organizing the meeting and kind of, or is the one sending information to, mm -hmm. to HR and then, or maybe HR is the one that, that has that information and then sends it back up to the general director, perhaps. So I think, I think, we allow that, that the direction for us is just uh, endogenous, right? As for nested communication, I think here. Well, just just Go ahead, to, uh, uh, to add to that, um, the direction of once the centralized information designer has given the person on top the message, then we allow for all kinds of orders and we allow for different people to be on top. But the information always comes from the same authority, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. if, we, if we were to think about aggregating first information at the bottom and letting it um, like go up, that's a bit different because here the, the, the information designer that dispatches the information structure is the same person, but he could allow to, he could be allowed to inform the workers first and the workers inform their supervisors and the supervisors inform the managers. But the central authority is always the one that, that dispatches the kind of... Yeah. yeah. And again, I think it also has to do with the fact that you are interested in a closed form for outcomes of communication, right. but not with an explicit modeling of the communication, if I That's understand. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah, 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 no, maybe we should. I don't know. It's uh, it's um. Close form, yeah. 
about things. And so the, the last one sounds to me like a, excuse me, a mixture of maybe a horizontal and vertical transmission. So there's a horizontal, there's vertical, there's mm -hmm. everything in between. You could imagine a meeting between two groups in which the next group would talk to the third and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. The sense in which I'm supposed to understand that, right? Next yeah. mm -hmm. right. I, I completely agree. I think um, here we're focusing on extreme forms to really clarify these ideas, uh, but then everything in between is, is very interesting as well. And maybe in future work, we can, uh, we can uh, clarify that and see, see what happens. Uh, but absolutely nested communication is natural next step. As for the previous slide, I honestly, I'm not sure. So I, you know, was uh, quicker there. So maybe I should just let her uh, take over or maybe you can, if, so Ina, if you want to jump in, you can, otherwise I would love to ask Olivier to kind of expand a bit on this. I, I thought it was very interesting, but I was a bit confused. Um, I don't know, Ina, do you want to jump in or should I maybe clarify? Um, I mean, the way I understand, uh, I understood your question is um, that, so in, you're right that if you consider single meeting schemes, we presume local common knowledge, right? We presume that a subset of players are informed. We do not allow them to communicate with each other once they are given the information. So we, are not, we don't allow the people in the meeting to communicate with the other players outside of the meeting. Right. So, so, so to, to rephrase the question, okay, I think the original problem, the way I see it, maybe, you know, it's just one branch that I have more in mind, is players receive information. There is an information structure, okay? It's exogenous. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't change it, okay? Mm -hmm. Then you put in place a protocol in which they communicate, okay? And once they communicate, they're, they're done, you know, they can communicate through a certain protocol, they can communicate through a mechanism, a centralized mechanism, decentralized meetings, direct messages. Well, there are plenty of things like this. And once they have finished their communication, they choose actions, okay? And so both communication and uh, uh, actions are chosen strategically. Mm -hmm. And so you have a lot of incentives that you have to be careful about. Of course, the uh, revelation mechanism shows that direct mechanisms are enough there. And so there is an explicit uh -huh. modeling of the communication phase with an exogenous okay. uh, information phase. Right, in the right, right, right. So okay. what here we have endogenous information and an implicit uh, communication system kind of. That's what I think. So I yeah. have the impression you focus on the outcome when you say yeah, there yeah. is direct communication, right. not modeling agent I sends his type yeah. or her type to yeah. agent J. You're saying, no, no, look, look uh, you know, uh, uh, one player knows everything that the other player knows. So this is what is, you know, but, representing but you could, right? the outcome of the fact that they have direct, direct communication. Okay. But when you say this, if I'm not mistaken, you don't study the question whether agent I would like to reveal the correct information or lie to agent J, because that's not even a question. It's just, just not there. Well, so that... Let me just kind of say. so in the case of single meeting scheme, as as Ina said, there's no communication there, right? So so we're just saying suppose the designer has control of information. The protocol at least is to invite some people. They get their information. Others are uninvited, and so on. In the case of a vert vertical transmission, if you speak to the highly the high the highest uh, informed player, in, and you plant the seed there given the incentive constraints mm -hmm. that guy you, you're really initiating a cheap talk game at the top where that guy is then going to transmit whatever information is necessary to the next okay. player the next player is then going to do that mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and so there is an implicit given okay. the incentive, given the incentive constraint given how that object is defined it is the equilibrium of, a, of a, an implicit sequential cheap talk game that we're not okay. you know yeah. So, so maybe there are results out there saying that, you know, what you characterize are indeed uh, the outcomes of certain communication protocols. It's, it's a little bit reminiscent of um, um, 
Jeanne and uh, I'm forgetting this. Frédéric, maybe? Inexcusable, yeah, it's Frédéric Kostler, mm -hmm. yeah, Hagenbach and Kostler, mm -hmm. where you have a fixed information structure. Right. And then you have any network that you want, so the pre play communication, and let's see what happens. Let's mm -hmm. see what, what emerges as a communication network. Let's see what outcomes. Right. So we're saying we're, we're not allowing all networks. We're saying it has to be a line network. But mm -hmm. we're playing mm -hmm. with communication. We're saying communication is endogenous. There is a, a mediator out there, right? or a cor correlating device, which can manipulate information at the top and then uh, information trickles down. What can happen in this case? But if we interpret Oliver's, uh, Olivier's question as a question of, because we have a sentence in our introduction, if players were to self-organize to receive information in a certain way, and uh, uh, however, this Olivier has to be with commitment in our environment. So if they were to self-organize in single meeting schemes with commitment so that they decide on the of who is with whom when, but don't communicate afterwards with each other, then that would represent kind of what you're talking about. But we are not allowing for the single meeting schemes for them to have communication afterwards. And for the delegated hierarchy, we just show that one particular communication of a cheap talk game is an equilibrium, the one that we want truthful transmission. So we don't consider all possible communications that could emerge there. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's you can consider to with, with commitment of the players, how they want to self-organize to receive information um, in both instances, but yeah. Does that kind of, does that answer? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's, a, so it's a fixed way of exchanging information. Not everything is allowed. So there's still a third party, as Ina just said, a, a protocol out there that has been decided mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. either by a third party or maybe the players, you know, self-organize that way. And mm -hmm. they don't go out of that. So in, in um, some of the papers I had in the lit review, there's a very flexible way in which agents can communicate and they, the, the, the network is endogenous here it's kind of, kind of fixed the designer says or you know the organization whoever that is like what would be a simple way in which the organization could share information and then the statuses are written and this is how it happens right hmm. So hopefully that clarifies that clarifies this. Yep. Someone raised their hand, uh, Mikael. Yeah. Hi. So so I, I have a curious question. So suppose you basically, I mean, this kind of meeting is some kind of way to kind of force people to get the same information. Can you do something like you take a meeting, then the least senior person is thrown out. You have another meeting, something like to kind of force some kind of hierarchy structure in information that is non-strategic. I mean, I guess this is something that a firm could implement and it doesn't sound completely crazy or maybe it is not to me. I, I couldn't quite hear you. I'm, I'm, I'm so, so basically you can, the structure of how people meet that you can set this like, you have a meeting with a certain group of people and then one group of people have to go, only the seniors stay or something like this. They have another meeting. And this way you can implement in some sense without incentive constraints, maybe some additional kind of information structures. This kind of guarantees that the people who stay longer at the meeting or the more restrictive meeting are better informed. Uh, so, so you're suggesting to um, implement information hierarchies in that way? Or to look what kind of, what basically what you can do to bypass these incentive constraints by basically forcing a specific structure of how people can communicate. Yeah, we have that. We that is just the information hierarchies. If you get rid of the transmission incentives, and if you just look at information hierarchies, then you can characterize what you can just implement with information hierarchies. Okay. 
Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, sorry. That, that get that get rid. What you're suggesting is get rid of the transmission incentives because you are excluding people. So yeah. you don't you're not requiring the more informed ones to transmit to the less informed ones. Yeah. So, but you are creating information hierarchies, and we have a characterization just for information hierarchies as well. Okay. And, and it seems the question is also related to how you would group people in a way that you would break incentives to misreport, perhaps. Right? Because it seemed like what he was, what uh, Michael or Michael uh, was suggesting that, that uh, it, somebody who may want to misreport, maybe by grouping them together, you, you eliminate that. And so there's a question of what is the disk? maybe smallest group in which you could implement the, right? So if, if you look at a hierarchy, it's completely decentralized and this is great. You see the information at the top, but what if down the line, one person doesn't want to communicate truthfully? Is there a way of kind of grouping them at this point? So the person above them would speak to two people directly instead of one, maybe, I don't know. I guess in the military is something where you have a very strong system of who's allowed to talk to or, whom. Right, so, or in the statuses it's written so, so strictly that, uh, yeah, violation of the, of, the right, of the ranking is punished. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.